Do we have videos? Good, Good morning, everybody. Andrew's fired. <laughs> Sam's a <short> so, <laughs> No. So we know. Wake up. Wake up. Wait, in Provincetown. We're gonna we're gonna talk 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 and then do the fill video. This week and then we can regroup while we're doing the video. Probably about a half hour in. In fact, in fact, we'll be here. Perfect. Um, Mark will be here. Strong, please. He's here. He's had a I know you're doing great, Mark. Everyone's doing great. Hey. Wait, did you? No, really, can I have some coffee? Wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Wake up, wake up. No? All these people are gonna be all of a sudden Good morning, everyone. Sorry for starting a little late, but it is Friday, March 1st. It's March, you guys. Yeah. Spring is right around the corner. We had an extra day in February, though. That was super fun. What did yeah. you do for your leap day? Um, my leap day was fun. I worked on stuff, wake up, trivia. And then last night we had a really fun trivia. We actually started um, March a day early, which I think is fine. Um, but for all the month of March, it is Women's History Month. So for trivia, um, me and Evan are going to be taking some time off, and we're going to be filling the co-host seat with um, some of the brewery's favorite women over the next month. Last night, we had Sam Sewell, who is over behind the computer. She I loved your jumper round. Thank you, jumper round. <laughs> that was super fun. Yeah, the, uh, for Sam's visual round, she did. Um, she's like, well, it's Leap Day. Another name for Leap is Jump. Um, jumper, another name for jumper is sweater. So my round is all on sweaters. And I was like, wow, you're really making a leap when it comes to uh, that, was a, that was a leap. Uh, I love what I'm saying. Yeah, it was really perfect. But it was so much fun. Um, Sam was our first of five weeks of women co-hosts. Um, next week, we have Callie Lauer, who is a middle school teacher in Chatham. Um, so you're going to find out if you're as smart as her middle school kids. I know. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? We're no, going to find I, out. I think we know. We're not. We're not, right? No. Most of us are not. Atrophied brains. Oh, stop. I, I'm just speaking for myself. I, I mean, trivia was fun until my team lost. We finished second mm. last night. The Muff Divers. <laughs> no, so... <laughs> My friend Muffy was like, "Let's. I'm gonna get some people together to go play trivia." And I was like, "Oh yeah, that's. I, I've never played trivia with Muffy. I love her. She's one of my favorite people on the planet." And when uh, the the group was like, "What's our team?" And I was like, "The Muff Divers." And Muffy was like, "I'm not saying that." I was like, "You don't have to. Harrison and Sam have to say it <laughs> right. like multiple times." Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it was fun, and and I I don't believe Muffy for one second that she had nothing to do with that. She was like, <laughs> she was like, "That's ridiculous. We're not calling ourselves." That. I was like, "You're the team captain," and she's like. Okay. <laughs> um, it was exciting. There was a lot of new faces in the tap room last night. Yeah. yeah. It was super fun. And I, busy. I don't know if it was a coincidence or not, but we had a lot more women than usual, which is fantastic. Thank you, Muffy. Yeah. I will take yeah, of the we're gonna say it was Sam. The women love Sam. Sam and Muffy both. Yeah, but we have a we have um a, a good lineup. It's all the brewery's favorite women over the next month. Mm -hmm. There's Sam. Next week it's gonna be Callie. Um, I saw Rebecca Orchant on there. Rebecca Orchant is gonna be here. Um. Brittany, right. our current reigning bearded mistress, mm -hmm. as well as Kristen Becker. So wait, one of you will be there with them? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just trivia is one of those things that seems so easy to do, but there's a lot of moving parts and and just it, to throw two brand new people in would be a lot yeah. together. So it's one of us who've been doing it and then, um, then our amazing women co-hosts. Super fun. Yeah. What did, did, you, did you know that team that won last night? Eight is enough. No, I mean they, they call they come out a lot. because they had eight members. Yeah, is eight the maximum. Eight is there is we, eight is more than enough. <laughs> we kind our of our team had nine people. So I yeah, exactly. Um, and we still lost. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what we're gonna. The hard part about it is we typically have we say there's a team limit of six, but to enforce that rule, I'm worried that it would discourage people from coming. Because right. say say you have eight friends and you all want to hang out and do something, you want to do trivia. I'm not gonna make them split up. You came to hang out with your eight friends. Right. Um, you have to have points deducted for every extra member. I was That's what he that. was going to do. Yeah. And 
I was thinking about whether we were going to have to do that at the end of the night, and we were looking at the scores. The team eight is enough was ahead by three points. Mm -hmm. So they would have had two points subtracted. The, and the two and we were next, and we had more people. Yeah, exactly. That. You were in second place. And there was a team of three or four, um, Superman's birthday. I, they were le leading after halftime. Yeah. Um, so I was just thinking, even if they did subtract the two points, it wouldn't have mattered. I know. And also having extra people didn't help us in the end. No. Like, it's not a guaranteed victory just because you have nine people. And also, see, like, I kept glancing over your team because you were right in front of me, and I... I don't, like nine people were there and hanging out, but it didn't quite seem like nine people were. No, there were people just fully drinking, actively yeah. playing trivia. Yeah. It definitely seemed like you and Muffy and like a couple other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We tried. It was a valiant effort. Thank you, Muff Divers, mm. for doing as well as we did. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, trivia. I I know I keep saying this, but trivia has been amazing this winter. Um, such a fun crowd, a big lively crowd. The past we've been doing it for four years now, and usually in the winter it's like. Are we gonna have three or four teams tonight? Hopefully. And right. now, like last night, we had 14 teams. Yeah. It really is a fun event. Come hang out. Um, this month is a great time to come and check it out because there'll be new people um, adding new energy. Mm -hmm. Did you do anything else off for your leap day besides trivia? What else did I do yesterday? No, that was pretty much it. The whole day built up to this. Oh, you know what I did do right before I came here? Um, Janet's in town. She opened the Red Room for... Uh, Hump Day Karaoke Leap oh, Day. Oh, right. Not Hump Day, Leap Day Karaoke. Uh, so it was nice to see Janet because she lives in Maine in the winter. Oh, right. But she was here to open the Red Room. Cute. They have another event this weekend. I can't... Kiki T. Kiki T. Kiki T on Saturday. Yeah. So Red Room is open this Saturday from, I want to say, 4 to 8? Yes. 4 to 7. Hmm. Um, like tea dance it, It's so funny because I was just saying, um, I was like, I wish one of these nightclubs would do a, like, 6 to 9 club event i'm like you're getting your wish yeah because i'm not i i can't be out of the house past nine o'clock in the winter <laughs> um but i did get um one of the things i did this weekend last weekend was um miss S snowbound i was like leather or something you always said miss snowbound mr snowbound leather you went to the pageant i didn't go to the pageant it's not a pageant sorry you went to the Competition. Competition? Yeah. Um, I didn't go to the competition. So, um, I, but I did get up to a couple of the leather events. Um, one that I definitely wanted to check out was the one that happened here at the brewery last Saturday from one to three. They were doing a, um, it was called Informed Kink, and it was a live roping demonstration. And it was um, teaching people knots, people, teaching people some basic um, rigs might be what they called. I don't know. Uh, Were you not paying attention? They probably told you what it's called and you don't remember. I was paying attention-ish. You know? Girl, what? Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a hot guy getting tied up. I was paying attention oh. to something. Pictures? You have pictures? Is there a picture? Oh, I do have a picture. Right there is pictures of said hot guys getting tied up. Um, but it was fun and informative. And I think what a lot of people don't really realize when it comes to kinks a lot of kinks is like there's a danger element and you have to be safe and you have to know that's why people like it yeah, well right but you also like don't want to give um someone lifelong nerve damage because you tied them up wrong oh. for 20 minutes yeah exactly what a coincidence that's my safe word lifelong nerve damage that's what I scream out when somebody ties me too tight. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then after that, I uh, walked around town a little because I really wanted to make it to the four to seven party, which was very cute. It, I can't remember the name. It was alliterative and rhyming. Straps and claps or something like that. <laughs> Straps and chaps. That sounds was that likely. Yeah, something. Uh, but Mark, that was... Mark's like, I don't know. <laughs> I wasn't here. I don't know. Oh, right. Um, bust. <laughs> but I went over to Purgatory, checked that out. That was a lot of fun. I feel when there's like leather events or events geared towards specific communities that I don't quite fit into. Mm -hmm. Like I went and I was like, well, if I don't have any leather, I'll just wear as little as possible. So I just wore like my work, my boots and um, a jock strap. And I just feel like they're like, you're not a leather person. And I just like danced alone for two hours. Strap is not leather. I know. No, I, no, 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 I know. I, I know. But um, I wasn't, I didn't get engaged with much. Mm. So I just like danced in the corner in my jock strap. It was fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, my hat off to the staff there. It's winter. A lot of places are understaffed. The party really popped off. And to have, it ran especially well considering I think they had two bartenders, one clothes check person and one bar back. Snowbomb's always fun. Yeah. It's a great weekend. Yeah. 
Did you do anything this weekend? Um, I went. I didn't go to any of the events, mm -hmm. but we were. Um, you know, I, I have some friends in town who like never go out in the winter, and they were like, "Oh, it's an event. Let's go out because there's actually people yeah, exactly. around." It was a yeah. fun reason just to get out of the house for people that don't normally get out of the yeah. house. Yeah, I was like, "When's the next time I'm going to be able to dance in a jockstrap?" Right. Whenever I want. Next yeah. week for. Out of, Ooh, out of hibernation. Oh, is that next week? week? Yeah. Oscar weekend. I love out of hibernation week, especially because not that this is a criticism, but I feel like bear week in the summer has turned into like the circuit gays of 10 years ago decided to grow out their chest hair. And now they're like, we're bears now. <gasps> um, which Ethan is co-signing. Yeah. This. Do your thing. I love it. But the bear community did start out of, a, a desire to belong and a desire to not be kind of held to this outrageous standard of um, body perfection. <laughs> um, and I feel like the out of hibernation, it, it, it's a little more like the core of what the bear community is, which is um, community togetherness. You can be yourself, um, let loose a little without mm -hmm. judgment. And I feel like there might be a little judgment worked in, well, that's worked its way into bear week in the summer. Um, okay. Yeah. I always feel I'm like... I'm not going to disagree with I that. feel like with Bear Week and Fourth of July right next to each other, I really... I'm just over here existing in the middle. I'm not a circuit gay. I'm not a bear. You're in between. Yeah. You're a circuit bear. Circuit bear. They exist. Be a little circuit bear. I love when people go like, what are you, a cub? And I'm like, do you just call me fat? <laughs> 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 I'm like, no, I'm an otter. Thank you. I guess I'll do a little extra cardio this week. You've been at the gym every single day for the last few months. Yeah, I've not the last you. few months, just February. But I've been going a lot. Yeah. yeah. Um, You're going to be that judgy, exclusive circuit fan. I decided I'm going to be hot this summer. I'm going to give it a try, see what it's like. <laughs> Um, but I have been enjoying going to the gym. I love the gym in the winter. It's always kind of the same crew, and everyone's nice and friendly, and it's not too packed. Um, Except for Wednesday at 6. It's packed. Oh, those classes. It's Charles's People, boot camp yeah. class. People get there like an hour early to set up a spot. Good for them. I know. I don't like being told what to do for an hour. You don't? Yeah, I, I like being on my own schedule. You don't like group fitness classes? No, it's not that I don't like them. Um, I'm not very strong or physically able. So I go to these fitness classes. Everyone else is doing it. I'm not mm -hmm. doing it. And my knee-jerk reaction when I'm not good at something is to make jokes about it, mm -hmm. and you're not supposed to do that. No, you just dance in the corner in a jock shirt. Exactly. You and treat group fitness classes after, like a leather event. After the first few yoga classes that I went to with Stefan, he had to be like, Harrison, you can Because <laughs> I was like falling over and like thinking, oh, now it's my turn to be a stand-up comedian, and it just was not the vibe. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. What else did you do this week? Um, not much. The gym, trivia leather stuff yeah yeah oh by the way you guys this weekend tonight actually well really tomorrow uh the 24-hour play festival mm. is happening at the provincetown theater this is one of my favorite annual winter events it's always right around now the first weekend of march um we will meet at the theater tonight the writers will be assigned actors and a director and props that they must use on stage the writers will write a play tonight and they will be performed tomorrow at seven so buy your tickets now because this always sells out. Wait, it's, so you have you're writing a play? I'm writing this year. Um, I wrote last year. I've written maybe I think this has been going on for 15 years in town. I've written like four times for it, I mm -hmm. guess. And so that's my favorite part. Like I've been an actor in it, and I'm I much prefer being a writer for it because then you like once you pull done, an all nighter done. and you're done. Yeah. Like you you should go to the rehearsal the next day, but if you're sleeping, they understand because <laughs> like you stayed up all night writing a play. So you haven't gotten your cast or props yet. No, you don't know anything. So we're all meeting at the theater tonight at seven, and then 24 hours later, wow. the shows get performed. That's why. So there are seven writers. You're going to see seven brand new, fresh, original one act plays that were written tonight. That's insane. I know. Wow. It's really, really fun. And um, because it's so popular, they started doing a Sunday matinee performance. Oh, work. So there's Saturday at 7, which will, it, if it's not sold out already, it's going to sell out today. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday at 2. So go to provincetowntheater.org and buy your tickets for this. It's super fun. It's 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 really exciting to watch people do something that's like, mm -hmm. it's brand new. Like, yeah. it just happened. It's like a baby bird hatching. The theater's been doing so well. I mean, Costa Valentina sold out its first run, came back for another sold out run, won a bunch of Broadway World Awards. The Fantastics was their highest selling production they've ever done. Um, 
Did you, I, you were doing that. I was scratching my ear, but I mean, <laughs> uh, um, but that's great. Yeah, they had a, a, so many people audition for this upcoming season. They're adding shows. I'm so happy and proud that our community is, because regional theaters are struggling everywhere all across the country, and I'm so oh, proud yeah. of the community for supporting this one. Um, and if you can and would like to support more, I highly suggest if you're going to the theater this weekend to get a season subscription for them. I think it's two seventy five right now. You get tickets to five shows, preferred seating, and you get to support amazing theater. Yeah, it's awesome. And Peter Marie Toto was nominated for a Broadway award, right? I don't think so. Oh, I thought you said he Bo. was. From the oh, Fantastics. Oh no, yeah. I saw Peter Toto and I was like, I heard you were nominated for an acting award. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, Harrison told me on the show the other no. day. No. Oh, congratulations, Bo. Yeah, it was Bo Jacket who played <laughs> um, El Gallo in the Fantastics. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was Peter. No. No. Oh. Wow, that was mean. It wasn't Just mean. Kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, also, there are a couple of, of uh, events that I do want to highlight. I'm a special guest for an Oscar party happening here at the brewery hosted by Tadana and Racine. I'm going to be doing a little number there as local honey. That's going to be a ton of fun. A movie orient or like a movie themed number? I I know what the other two are doing and there's, there's such great ideas and I want to do something in the similar vein, but I'm having trouble coming up with something that is as good as those two, but with the th same mm -hmm. inspiration, but I'm going to come up with one. Racine uh, Knox to be, she's a writer yeah. tonight too. No way. Yeah, Racine's busy. This is I know. the first season. Yeah. Um, there's three Oscar parties that night. Yeah. If you're in the mood for like a red carpet type event the Provincetown uh, Film Society and the Crown and Anchor are doing like mm -hmm. a re like what they did for the Grammys. You guys have your event here. Yeah. And the Governor Bradford. And the, yeah, Liza and Abby yeah. and the Governor Bradford. Another event I'm really excited about, I think it is Tuesday, March 17th. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive, but I do have the poster up. Um, I know Bob knows this, I'm a, I'm a gamer. Mm -hmm. That's gay-mer. But um, I'm really big into Mario Kart. Mm -hmm. I love it so much. And we are the Crown and Anchor hosted by Giselle, and it is a, a fundraiser for Summer of Sass, is doing a Mario Kart tournament. On Tuesday the 19th? Tuesday the 19th. It, I, Kristen sent me the link to buy a ticket. I bought one immediately, and I put in, do you know how it says like additional comments or something when you buy a ticket? I typed in, I'm going to win this, I promise. Are you definitely going to win? Yes. I promise. Really? Yeah. There's, there's, ah! there is no one better. Are you than, playing too? There is no one better than me at Mario Kart. My in this money's town. on Sam. That's that's a poor bet. I promise. <laughs> I promise. The um, shit talking has already begun. Yeah. Um. That's a part of Mario Kart. Is shit talking. I love when I have a random person come in Mario Kart and all of a sudden I'm like being. They're like you're being really mean. I'm like oh I'm so sorry. This is part of Mario Kart. The shit talking. Yeah. Um, but it is going to be in the Paramount on that gigantic screen, which even if I lose, which I won't, um, that <laughs> <laughs> that um, experience of playing Mario Kart on the big screen is going to be wild and fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a fundraiser for Summer of Sass. It's $20 to enter. I want so many other people to enter so I can beat them. Wow. Yeah. I really hope Sam demolishes you. <laughs> Demolish. <laughs> Um, I hope there is some competition as well, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, let's do a couple news stories. Okay. Um, we started like five minutes late, right? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure we're on the same we're good. schedule. We're good. Go. Um, news. Something that was in the news this week that's pretty wild. A, a, a few months ago, um, the recording artist Cassie sued her ex, P. Diddy, um, she, it was, um, she ended up settling, but it was Who's a, named in the lawsuit? Me and you. And, <laughs> me and you. That's a classic, the it's classic Cassie song. Um, but it was, it was settled, but she accused P. Diddy of rape, sexual, sex trafficking, and physical abuse. Um, but there is another lawsuit that was filed this week by a music artist named Rodney Jones. He's alleging sexually harassing, drugging, and threatening him over the course of more than a year while he was recording an album. Other people named in the same suit are allegations against Cuba Gooding Jr., who allegedly <gasps> sexually assaulted him. And the word on the street is that this is going to be like R. Kelly level of... Against Diddy? Yeah. And Cuba Gooding Jr.? I, I don't know how much his involvement, but he was named in the case. Um, basically, the word is is that Diddy has his house entirely monitored by live cameras at all times, and he puts people in 
sexual situations and then reveals to them that he recorded it and then uses it as sexual blackmail. Um, <clears throat> that sounds bad. Yeah, that's horrific. And it's, and basically using the homophobia within the rap community yeah. to basically like coerce people into doing things they wouldn't normally do and then being like, oh, now I have a video of you doing something kind of gay. If you If you do anything I don't like, I'm gonna release this. Yeah, um, I first got, I first, my first inkling that something really bad was going to happen and that Diddy was going to be um, kind of exposed as a monster was when about a year ago, he had offered the publishing rights to a lot of different artists' music back to them. And everyone was like, oh, that's so <coughs> great. He's giving the publishing rights back to the artist who created the music. And then Aubrey O'Day, who's one of my favorites, she was in Danity Kane, who, which was a girl group that was created on TV by Diddy, yeah. came out and was like, do not do this. Because she's like, I know how much money this makes. Danity Kane's music is going to make a few hundred dollars over the next year per the five of us. And in order to get the publishing rights back, you have to sign an NDA saying you won't say anything that happened during your experience with Danity Kane. So she wouldn't sign it? She wouldn't sign it. And she's like, if any of the girls in the group met, like, reach out to me if you need that few hundred dollars a year, I will give it to you. Do not sign this. You're losing so much of your rights in doing this. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Aubrey O'Day. And I, I, she is so smart. And I can't wait for her to be a part of Taking Diddy Down. Oh, man. Yeah. She was, she was, um, the runner up in Celebrity Apprentice. And I know that was a terrible, <laughs> ridiculous show, but the people competing on it were really smart business people. And mm -hmm. I think she is. Um, so I'm excited to see the takedown. The takedown, it seems like it's well deserving. In happier news, um, one of our favorite local ish girls, Jinx Monsoon, is back in the news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was, um, she did a really incredible run as Mama Morton in Chicago about a year ago. She left, came back because everyone wanted to see her in it. The, the limited run of her back in Chicago immediately sold out. Um, she's now filming Doctor Who, and a, another acting credit is going to be added. She just announced that she's going to be taking over for Evan Rachel Wood in the role of Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors. That is a vocally challenging part. Yeah, I wonder if they're going to change keys for her. They have to. No. No? No. Why? So one, a, I saw her in Chicago, and did, the, the matron Mama Morton part is a lot easier than... It's an alto -y role, so yeah. as um, a musical theater tenor... Yeah, I'm not being shady, but... Yeah, that's a very... It's, it's high. I wonder... There is a way she could do it without changing keys, but I feel like she'd be more comfortable if they did change keys. I'm... Jinx Monsoon really loves so what is it eat up the scenery is that what it is chewing the scenery chewing the scenery when you just like lay it on really thick right. and I have a feeling we're gonna get like a snatch game version of Ellen Green as oh I can't wait yeah Ellen Green is one of my favorite an icon um she took a she role is awesome. yeah she took a role on paper that could have been just oh I'll just play it as a bimbo and she really played it incredibly and smart and she made really fun vocal choices and just incredible one of the best musical theater performances of all time yeah if you're in new york this summer i think she returns to chicago at the end of june march for, like march? no she's back at the end of june for like two weeks in chicago yeah oh and then a little shop will be probably after that oh i think yeah. right. i thought i wrote it down i thought it was in march that she was taking over but oh, maybe she's doing little shop first but she's yeah. back in chicago Cute. at the end of june. that's great um she's taking over for evan rachel wood uh, Constance Wu played Audrey before that. And I, I hope this show runs forever on stunt casting like Chicago. Right. It is a perfect vehicle to just stick people into these classic roles, mm -hmm. the classic nerd, the bimbo, make it your own. And I hope Little Shop runs off Broadway forever and we get to see the most ridiculous people play those roles. I know. I want to go see Jinx do it. That's going to be fun. Okay. Um, Nick Offerman also won an ind independent spirit award this past week and um he's on a roll yeah um he's he said um he loves that stories with guts he said stories with guts that when homophobic hate comes my way and he says when people will be like oh why'd you have to make it a gay story he said um because you ask questions like that it's not a gay story it's a love story you asshole mm -hmm. yeah 
And I think that's what pe that's what I was hoping people were going to take away from that episode is like, um, the reason there is a need for gay stories is because exactly what it's saying. It's a love story, and you sh I hope that people can see past. Oh, it's a gay story, and just see that it's a love story. Yeah. yeah. Um, he said that he had previously expressed interest in a spinoff for the two characters played by him and Mari Bartlett, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, but he did say, if homophobes hated a single episode with gay people on the last season of The Last of Us, boy, are they going to hate where things are headed. Really? So that means I'm going to love where things are headed. He knows a lot more than we do. I can't wait for season two of that. Catherine mm. O'Hara. Work. I mean, that's enough for this gay person, you know? Yeah, the casting that's happening in the next year of television, Catherine O'Hara on season two of Last of Us, Parker Posey on season three of White Lotus. Wow. I also, I, I, I forgot to make a story, but they did announce that Liar Mouth, which is John Waters' um, most recent book that he released, I'm sure you can get a copy at the local bookstore or even MAP. I think they have signed copies at MAP because mm -hmm. uh, Pauline is good friends with John Waters. But they just announced they're going to be making it into a movie starring Aubrey Plaza. Really? Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Um, and I think the town crier is going to be in it, too. No way. Maybe. Work. <laughs> How do I get in it? How do you get in it, Bob? You have to be the town crier. Oh. I'm coming for your gig. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, one more news story, and then we'll move along. So Mitch McConnell announced this past week. Wait, you're not going to talk about that? No. Oh, come on. We'll do, the ex we'll do an expose on it sometime soon. OK. Um, so Mitch McConnell is going to be stepping down from House leadership. Um, our, from Senate leadership in November. Um, this is the quote, which I think is wild. He said, one of life's most underappreciated talents is to know when it's time to move on. How would he know? How exactly? It was time for him to move on yeah. like 10 years ago. He is 82. He um, has been serving in, in Senate leadership since 2007. He's been a senator since 1985, before I was born. Um, his current term ends in 2027. He's currently 82. He will be 85 when his current term ends. Yeah. When asked to comment, Mitch McConnell said. Yeah. And as much as I don't care for his <laughs> politics or who he is as a person, um, I see the humanity in him as a person. And I'm just like, I, like, I wish that you would be able to enjoy the life that most 80 year olds want to have, which is like making sandwiches, watching your stories, sitting on your couch watching and your enjoying your grandkids. I like, I know that my grandparents absolutely love doing that in their eighties. And have grandkids, doesn't I he? wish he would find the joy in that as well. Thank yeah. you for your service. No, <laughs> I won't go that far. Um, yeah, that's it for news that I've got. All right. Yeah. Um, let's head on over. We sat down with Phil Jimenez this past week at the Commons. Um, I knew what he did, but I didn't know the expanse of what he did. Oh, yeah. It is amazing. wild and amazing and incredible. Check out One this of my interview. Favorite interviews ever. Mm -hmm. He only cries three times. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm hanging out at the Commons with artist Phil Jimenez, who is in his office right now. He's going to show us a little bit of what he's working on. I think um, most of your fans probably know you for your DC work, right? Yes, um, most of my fans know me probably for Wonder Woman and the Teen Titans, and then my Marvel fans know me for X-Men and Spider-Man. X-Men. X-Men. When I was 12, that was when the X-Men were rebooted in comics. Oh, yeah? And I told you I have like every single one of my, we have to talk about comic books later, but first let's talk about Provincetown. Okay. Um, tell, us, tell everybody a little bit about your personal relationship with the town. Um, Hi everyone. Uh, so I started coming to Provincetown, I believe, in the year 2000 as a 30-year-old. I used to stay at the ranch, which um, Stuart has since converted into beautiful cruise quarters. Um, and I came here uh, every summer um, until I moved here. As a matter of fact, um, it was it was a, pilgrim a pilgrimage I never missed over a period of 20 years. Um, as I was telling you earlier, I, I moved here with a very specific agenda, and um, one I am uh, as passionate about as ever. Um, Provincetown is really important to me. It was really important to me as a as a as a gay man, and really important to me as a place where I felt the most me, which I think is a sensation many of us feel mm -hmm. when we come here. 
Um, everyone just talks about the magic of this place, and particularly when we're here for a limited time, it can feel like no other place. So one of the reasons I moved here was because um, I'd been watching the place transform. And just a little. Just a little bit, <laughs> and gentrify in ways that I have found disturbing. So I moved here to um, be a vote and <clears throat> be an active part of the community, and if not stop, help curb and shape um, the dramatic change that is happening to the town to make sure that the town and all its magic remains accessible to the widest um, pool of people, particularly queer people who often feel alienated from this place because it feels so exclusive. I'm currently working on a story at DC Comics. It's really all about the search for gay utopia. Mm -hmm. and I, <laughs> I actually believe in the potential of this place because I've experienced it. So, sorry everyone. Um, um, the book is a reflection on my time here and my time in other gay spaces and their importance. Again, I think particularly in this political environment and um, I, f I fear the magic fading, and I want to make sure that it doesn't. Thank you for doing your part. Well, thank you. So tell us a little bit about what you're working on these days. Um, so it's mentioned I write and draw superhero comics um, for mostly Marvel and DC, um, which would be Disney and Warner Brothers. Uh, I'm best known for Wonder Woman and the Teen Titans over DC and X-Men and Spider-Man at Marvel. I'm currently working on a, um, a book called The Titans, which is... Uh, a lot of people might remember the cartoon Teen Titans Go, which was based on another book called New Teen Titans. That cast of characters were all the sidekicks of the Justice League, all grown up. Mm -hmm. So Robin, Wonder Girl, Kid Flash, but now Nightwing, Troya, Flash. Um, and it's, it's a team I've been associated with most of my career, so probably about 30 years. Uh, and I love them. And my favorite comic book character of all time, who is Donna Troy, Wonder Woman's kid sister, uh, is the main character of this book. And this book is actually, in many ways, a love letter to Provincetown. And <laughs> a lot of my friends in town um, will find themselves cameoed in the book, <clears throat> um, which I'm really excited about. I got their permission. No one's in there without asking. Mm -hmm. um, but I think anyone that lives here, uh, uh, they're going to see a lot of familiar faces in really hilarious scenarios. The characters live in New York City, so they don't live in, Pro the story doesn't take place in Provincetown, but I was able to just <clears throat> take photographs of so many mm -hmm. and turn them into characters on subways, walking through the streets of New York, um, even um, a, a, new, a new major supporting character for this Donna Troy uh, is based on someone I know here. Why Donna Troy? Why is she your favorite? <clears throat> so Donna Troy is Wonder Woman's kid sister. She was... Uh, Wonder Girl for many, many years. Um, I think there have been four Wonder Girls since that happens in comics. <laughs> um, I like to say that um, Wonder Girl was, part of it was she was one of the first comic books I ever read about, or, re or first comic characters I ever read about. So I think a lot of it has to do with age and like how we connect with characters at a certain time. She was more accessible than Wonder Woman in that she was a, a human child adopted by the Amazons and rather than be sort of like this godlike figure, she was a very normal, boy-crazy uh, character who could just happen to throw a car over her head. <laughs> um, but the thing... So sorry, you caught me. Um, there are other YouTube videos where I'm caught crying. I cry a lot. Um, I'm very earnest. Um, but the thing I loved about Donna was she was adopted. And what that meant for her character, um, and the way it was played out with, by, with most of her creators, was she was the best little girl in the world. So she was always top of her game in everything she did. And I found that as a gay teen who was very much the best little boy in the world, I really connected with that kind of energy and spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, she's a character that is incredibly well regarded. Um, uh, both in universe and its mythology and out, although she has a very messy history, which I think a lot of gay people can relate to. But I think that sense of needing to perform and needing to be on all the time, needing to be perfect, mm -hmm. resonated with me deeply. 
And so I just have connected with that character. And finally, she's just fun to draw because she, she's a photographer in New York City and a fashion photographer. Um, she just has fabulous hair and fabulous clothes, so when she's not fighting crime, I get to dress her up. <laughs> and, um, and she's one of the only crime fighters I would ever put in heels. <laughs> Donna Troy <laughs> fights crime in heels. And you also had a hit in last year's carnival poster. I did. Uh, so one of the one of the wonderful things about what I get to do um, in, the, in the sort of art making that I do is constantly pay tribute to the place I love and the people I love here in town. Uh, and that was one of those projects. So uh, we've never done it officially, but there is, I think, 24, 25 Easter eggs on that poster. Mm -hmm. um, town personalities, locations, um, and... A, a handful of people kind of know them and has sort of know to look for them, um, but it's 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 really fun and it's absolutely my tribute to my time here. Really and how's your uh, Tuesday drawing class going? So if you don't know, um, um, Carlos Jimenez, his husband John, and I are uh, we host a drawing class at Gifford House Tuesday nights. It's at seven thirty. It's actually going really really well. Um, every and um, I sort of conduct a sort of class. I, I taught life drawing at School of Visual Arts in New York City for about 15 years. So I try not to be too annoying because it's not really a class. It's just folks getting together to draw. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I think it's been really, really fun. People seem to be re really appreciative and really, really into it. We now have a crew of regulars that we can rely on to come on every week. Um, we're starting to mix it up with the models. Mm -hmm. What I actually love is how many how many people want to model, mm -hmm. <clears throat> as if it's um, uh, like it's almost a badge of honor. As, and the models are really funny because particularly when we're doing longer poses and you have to stay still, they, it's it's a point of pride mm -hmm. not moving for most of them, which has been great. But it's it's been really, really wonderful and yet another space for camaraderie building in town. One of the things that um, <clears throat> I've been really grateful for here and places like the Commons um, and Gifford House, the brewery, and other establishments is that they host nights and events which mm -hmm. allow for uh, communion between friends. How long into the season are you going to do it? Uh, Azar just asked if he wanted tables for the summer. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's like, great. should he buy more tables because attendance has been high? Um, you know, it's it's winter, so people come and go, but like attendance has actually been consistent and high. And I think he's really excited by that. So my hope is that we'll continue it as long as he'll have us at Gifford House. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking a couple of minutes to chat with us. Sure, thank you. You guys go hang out with him on Tuesday nights. And if you see him in town, say hi. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. And we'll see you soon. Check out the drawing class on Tuesday nights over at the Gifford House and buy one of those comic books. They're beautiful. I know. Outrageous. Thank you, yeah. Phil. Yeah. He only cried three times. It was so cute. <laughs> um, please welcome Patrick. Patrick. Welcome back Thank to you. the show yeah. for the first time in three years. Thank the last you. time we chatted about the barracks was May of 2021. It's wow. It's been a long and winding <laughs> road for you. It has been. Uh, you know, it's been a little a little more difficult than we would have would have hoped, but mm -hmm. not, you know, big, big big visions aren't easy. Right. Right, 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 right. And the wheels are turning now. The wheels are turning. Um, we're Aiming to start start construction this this spring, uh, probably May, and we're aiming for completion for summer 2025. Um, it's a tight schedule, but it's I would really hate to miss another season because right. you, you can just you can see online every day people who are you know desperate for housing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk, just do a quick recap of what this project encompasses. So it's called the Barracks Project. It's basically um, the goal is to house people that are living and working in Provincetown. That's correct. And how many units is it going to be? It's uh, 43 units. Uh, about 28 of them are dormitory style mm -hmm. for seasonal occupancy and uh, 15 are uh, year-round apartments. And the dormitory space will also be used to house students for new educational programs in the off season oh when there aren't summer workers staying in them. Um, so I'm working with uh, multiple nonprofits and trying to develop programs where we'll bring, bring people to Provincetown for brand new programs. And, you know, as we know, a small number of people makes a difference in the winter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we're talking about more than a hundred people in the summertime working. About, a, about 130, mm -hmm. maybe That's a little more. A lot of people. 
Wow. And the um, in, in this case, we employers have the opportunity to reserve space, and they're making making a financial commitment to do that. Um, so on the employer side, they have the whether it's year round or seasonal, they they have the ability to secure space a year ahead of time, year and a half ahead of time. They can go recruit for staff and hire people and to come to Providence Town um, or return to Providence Town mm -hmm. or, or remain in Providence Town, whatever the case may be, um, knowing that there's housing arranged that that, that person can can then rent. Yeah. Um, and that the that piece also helps in the overall picture helps keep the rents down some because you do have the employers, um, you know, putting out some of the some of the money. Mm -hmm. uh, so they they get some some advantage from being able to recruit knowing they have housing, um, but they're also making a financial contribution and helping underwrite the project. Mm. It's interesting how quickly things have changed here. When I moved here nine years ago, it was hard to get a job because you had to guarantee housing to get a job. And then it, it was hard to get housing because you had to guarantee a job. Now it's like, if you can get housing, don't worry about a job, you'll get a job. Um, so it's just been wild how the past, just in the past eight or nine years, housing has become the thing that is contingent upon whether you can live here and work here. Yeah, it is, and it's it's getting more critical every day. Mm -hmm. So now things seem to be moving forward rather quickly. What have been the um, the last few things that have fallen into place to kind of get things going again? Um, getting private investors on, on board mm -hmm. um, has, has um, that has really allowed things to, to move fo move forward. Um, you know, hopefully the you know the the town will be able to do it. Um, you know, commit to a piece of the project. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some steps to that. Mm -hmm. You don't just go to a selectman meeting and make they, you know select board meeting and have that happen. <laughs> right. Um, but hopefully, that that piece will will fall into place mm -hmm. as well. Um, the uh, employers signing up is you know sort of proving that that this whole um, setup is gonna is gonna work. Mm -hmm. The level of interest from employers. It is we, we we will we will sell out. Oh yeah, we will sell out mm -hmm. prob probably by the end of this month. Wow. And you're gonna live on the site once it's completed, right? I am. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a there's a manager manager's apartment, and um, you know at least for the couple, first couple years, I'm planning to live there. That's gonna be you, um, the manager. Yeah. <laughs> and, this is Garrett on Facts of Life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that will be. You know, there, there certainly are management companies that would be happy to come in and manage it, but I, I like the idea of, of developing our own program, something mm -hmm. that fits for Problems Town yeah. and not just sort of dropping somebody in from, you know, could be from anywhere um, who uh, to bring their moors and, 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 and management style to the project. I think we'll develop our own program and management style first and then maybe i'll think about letting somebody right. else manage it it's you've lived in province your whole life i imagine um one of the inspirations for this project was wanting to see provincetown succeed and be able to um work moving forward so it, it is i mean there's you know there's a social aspect to it there's a business you know as a business owner um you know with my family's marine specialty store you know we, we rely on being able to get staff and for any any business owner or property own, and and property owner, you know, we all all rely on Provincetown having this fantastic um, selection of you know places to eat, places to drink, entertainment, retail, you know, everything you can can think of. And if there's no housing uh, for people who are working in all these businesses, you know, those businesses will go away. Mm -hmm. And then what will Provincetown be? You know, if, if you have a community where it's just homes and there's nothing to do, that that's kind of a hollow, you know, it's a hollow victory for somebody who owns one of those homes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's we've already seen it happening, uh, specifically since the pandemic. Restaurants that started only be opening, only being open five days a week when they used to be open seven, and those it didn't quite come back. And I think it's staffing is the biggest issue when you have one kitchen staff that works every day, you can't ask them to work seven days a week for six months. So it's a staffing issue. And the more staff, the more businesses that'll stay open, more places to eat. Right. And as businesses, you know, with a short season and high expenses, you know, they have to capitalize on, on 
the prime season. Mm. And if they can't get enough staff to be open as much as they should, then it's going to be hard for it's hard for those businesses to um, stay viable. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you that the barracks are sort of based on, like one of the original projects, like they were they turned into like five. That's correct. So like this is like a successful formula. That was a project in Wisconsin Dells, uh, Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin, which is uh, they build themselves as the America's capital of water parks. And uh, anyone from the Midwest would know. I did not until I started looking at this particular project. Mm -hmm. I wasn't familiar with the, the town. Um, but they faced similar issues to Providence Town in Cape Cod. They had um, 3,000 mostly J-1 students living in, in questionable conditions. Mm -hmm. And they um, built one, build, one building to uh, test the concept. It was very unknown if it was going to work. Uh, they immediately built that project out to uh, a total of five buildings. It's, as far as I know, it's the largest seasonal workforce dormitory in the United States with 1,400 beds. Wow, wow. wow. Uh, the CEO is on my advisory board as well as my development team. Um, that They also own a construction company. They built three more projects in Wisconsin Dells for other employers. And now they have, the city has 3,500 brand new dormitory beds in multiple wow. projects. And they've had um, interest from other municipalities, employers all over the country. And they, they just built um, dorms in Gatlinburg, Seaverville. Um, they've been contracted by City of Ocean City, Maryland. Uh, they just built dorms at Dollywood. So, so it's, uh, there's definitely a, anywhere there's, you know, limited real estate. It's a, it's an island. It's a peninsula. Or it's an area surrounded by a national park. There are serious problems with having housing for the workforce. And one of the biggest issues that I think this is addressing is the fact that um, historically, a lot of people have lived in very unsafe environments in Provincetown, and it's kind of been this weird, like known secret because it, if you start talking about it then you have to solve it and um i think this is a great step into getting people into more safe reliable housing with because i mean just last fall in the newspaper there were j1 students being not treated well in living situations so um thank you for creating this for safe housing yeah i think that's part of it i mean as a um you know as a as a community member as a business owner um, and even even as an American, you know, if we're inviting people to come here, predominantly from other countries, but not entirely, we certainly have a you know contingent of American workers. But um, we should be, as a, as a business owner or as a community member or even as a country, we should be saying that that these people are living in, you know, safe, um, not dis not disgusting um, housing. Because if if they, if we are inviting people here to work in our businesses and they're living in really bad places and we should all be embarrassed on those le those different levels. I agree. Yeah. And as you're about to cross the finish line, you're accepting a couple more private investors? Correct. Yeah. Um, so we, we are doing a raise for $1.2 million out of the $14 million project uh, for, through private investment. And we've got four people committed so far and we still need to raise about half that money in the private investment side. Um, what are the next steps? Is there a potential groundbreaking day in um, your sites? We are aiming for May, and awesome. it's, a t it's a tight schedule. Um, but you have to crack the whip on the. We all know how long things take in Brownstown when um, <laughs> they're on schedule. <laughs> we so. do have a we have a contractor who is has a very strong reputation for finishing things on time. Um, I've rare. got a great project manager on board, Michael McIntyre, who was uh, formerly. Uh, developed the uh, the brass key from scratch and redeveloped the Land's End Inn before that. Um, so I think we've got a good we've got a good team. And um, as long as all the you know, as long as we don't run into any roadblocks between here and uh, and breaking ground, we can we can get it done for 2025. And everything's wow. ironed out with the neighbors. Everyone's on board. Yes. Yes. We, we worked things out with the neighbors. They they had concerns. It was um, you know, it was a bit of a difficult road, mm -hmm. but um, we did we did work it out and and when we kind of started to get to agreement, several of the neighbors um, really put quite a bit of effort in um, from their side in trying to get everyone together and get it settled. So I do appreciate the effort that some of the um, neighbors put in towards the end to help get it settled. That's great. I'm yeah. a neighbor, so yeah, <laughs> I live right over by there, so I'm excited. Excellent. Yeah.
Um, thank you so much for coming in. The best of luck. Thank, thank you. you for everything yeah. you're doing. This is yeah. great for the whole time. Thanks. I can't wait for it to be done. I'm sure you can either. I, I, <laughs> yes. I'd be, be quite, it's been a long road. Yeah. I'd be very excited to uh, be up and running. We'll yeah. be there at the room and cut it. I'd love, love to have you there. Yeah. 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 Um, let's head over, on over to the Babes and Boys to check out everything we've got going on this weekend. Y'all, here we go. I hope February treated you well because March is here. And as always, on Friday, we have our Friday night flow chart. RuPaul, RuPaul, Britton, Clint, and Hillary all performing on Friday night. And also in happening on Friday night is the Muse Restaurant pop-up at the Waterford is opening on this Friday. Go check them out now and all season long. And then there's an open mic at the Underground. If you got something you want to say, you got something you want to sing, check it out at the Underground. Also, Liza Lot and Mike Flanagan will be on the piano on Fridays in March at 9 p.m. all Friday in March. And there's a special screening of the Drive Away Dolls film featuring Billy Huff and afterwards Scream Along with Billy is happening this Friday night. Then on Saturday, there's a Kiki Tea at the Red Room from 4 to 7. Come get your Kiki on. Have a twirl. Also, on Saturday and Sunday, the 24-hour play festivals are happening. Seven playwrights with seven directors, 21 actors in 24 hours. It's a hoot. Check that out. And then on Monday, Cody Plays is returning every other week at the Gifford House. It's a 2020 solo show of hard times, a tale of struggling bathhouse and the recession as a group performance is this week's Cody Plays. And then on Tuesday night, there's Tuesday night figure drawing at the Gifford House featuring moi. I will be your model this coming Tuesday. Get ready for a fun night. I think it'll be great. I've been modeling for four years at Pam and I'm ready to wow y'all with my skills. So come on out to Tuesday night figure drawing. Then there is two queens in a movie. They are showing For Your Consideration this Tuesday, March 5th. Come check that out. And then get ready for next week. This week's a little sleepy, but next week is Out of Hibernation, March 7th through 10th. It was a little bit of a quick one this time around, but if you have any info you'd like us to promote, please email babesandboys at gmail.com. And that has been the Wake Up Weekly Roundup with Sam Sewell. I'll check y'all later. <laughs> um, there's so much going on in Provincetown, even on an off weekend in March. There's no off weekend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Come hang out. Um, please welcome Mark and Beth. We let Mark step out from behind the camera today. Hi, guys. Hi. 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 Good to see you. Um, so we're talking about a really exciting project that Mark started last winter or two winters ago, a, a, a couple years ago. But it's, yeah, it's been it's been a, a, it's been growing. Yeah, it's a slow um, it's a slow boil. Yeah, so it's, uh, Mark's been calling it Winter Windows. Uh, tell us a little about the project, your inspiration for um, wanting it to happen. So my first winter here was a few years ago, and walking down the street in the winter time, I was like, wow, it's bleak when a lot of people close up, which it's a seasonal town. You want to be here busy in the summer and you know, you might want to go where it's warm and that's cool. But a lot of, a lot of businesses traditionally would put up brown paper in their window or white paper in the window or draw the blinds and stuff. And particularly in the West end, when you walk down there, it's like, this is a ghost town. And we spend a lot of money through the VSB, through the, uh, uh uh, tourism board and all these other things to get people here. We're like, we want to build this town used to close down labor day. Close mm. down when I first started coming here. Like if you came in the off season, you were doing nothing. Everything was shut. Mm. We are trying to build a year round community here. A lot of money is being spent on that. If someone from Hyannis comes to town in the middle of winter and walks down the street, there are businesses open, but they are surrounded by businesses that look like they're out of business, mm. not just closed down for the season. But so I thought, well, this has to be a better way. And around that same time, pandemic. Uh, time um, in the um, in the Hamptons, these big stores came in, took over from small businesses. So Coach moved in, and and Prada moved in, and they were like, "Yes, we'll take your money." And they were the first places that closed in the mm -hmm. pandemic, pulled out of these stores, and the landlords just went in and soaked up the windows. And people were like, "Wait a minute, like we live here, you can't just soap up the windows." So they actually passed an ordinance that said if you're closed for more than four weeks you have to put art in the windows. And they got arts organizations and they said, here are five arts organizations. We don't care if it's a sculpture, a, a 
painting, a sign, whatever. You can't just soap up your windows and close. Three years from now, if, you know, that's the, that's the ordinance is coming. Yes, that, that, that is a solution. But what, what I want to do is, I mean, look, I'm a small business owner. I'm closing. I'm closing. What, what am I going to do? I'm going to put brown paper in my window. That's the easy thing. It is now at a time when working with a, a, a printing company who um, is uh, also uh, a member of the community um, and uh, we have an ability to put up art in the window mm -hmm. in the winter time for not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It's super cheap. And I'm working with local artists, with the commons, um, and with business owners and saying, hey, here's a solution to, and I'll, put, I'll hang it. We'll put it up in your window. It's not a lot of money. And it's something the way the, we're printing it on vinyl. It's a reusable mm -hmm. thing. So it's a one-time cost. You can put this up every year and it will brighten the streetscape for people who do live here and walk their dogs and walk their business and also for people coming to town. Mm. So my goal is in a couple of years on that second week in January, you come to the winter windows unveiling and you walk down commercial street with a hot chocolate and you see all of these different pieces of art in the windows. That. And it doesn't have to be a painting. It can be a, a quote from a, an artist. It can be a big blow up of your logo. Mm. Anything is better than brown paper. Yeah. Anything yeah. to bring light and color to this town. We know how it's dreary after the holidays. And I approached Beth at the Commons and, and Jill and stuff. I said, I want to grab a couple artists from here. And I love the spirit of her work and the, mm -hmm. the, the cheeriness and the bright and the hope of her work. And Which that's why. Um, it's the former Wired Peppy oh, building mm. that has the orange. So I tried to go ahead and try it. I, I love orange and bright colors. She but, succeeded. Um, yeah, it's, and she was so wonderful, the owner, when they came by yeah. to pick. So it, it made me feel really connected mm -hmm. on top of it just being excited. Yeah. How do you, um, as an artist, approach such a large amount of space? Because the windows are huge. The exciting part and how easy it is is that they um, can blow it up on vinyl. So oh, right. she picked out her favorite ones that, that would match sort of the aesthetic of the wire puppy thing. And then they blew them up a little bit. They were, they were fairly large, but it was easy and cheap and it looked cool. Mm. So it was nice. What was great is that I had an idea in my head knowing Beth's work of what I was like, oh, this would work. And then Donna Valancourt, who is the owner of that space, um, Gabby, um, Hoff, Gabby um, Hannah hooked me up with her. She, I was like, Gabby, can we please not have a, just a barren window that says for rent? And she's yeah. like, oh, Donna, you know, speak to Donna. And I got in touch with Donna. And I said, do you want to meet Beth and see her work? And I had totally different ideas. And then Donna came in. Yeah. She's like, oh, I really like this. And, yeah. I, and I was like, okay, well, then that's what we're going to do. And then she's like, and I'll also put this one in the window, so nice. too. And I was like, oh, two, and you're going to pay for it. Great. So um, nice. perfect. I've financed some of the windows myself over the years. Cafe Heaven, um, when, when he first started closing in the winter and he was putting up brown paper and then he was like, I'm going to get drapes made. And I was like, why don't we do an art thing? So mm -hmm. Benji and Paul mm -hmm. Rizzo, like we did that and Gaston helped that first year print it on very expensive paper. Mm -hmm. Like that was a fortune to print those windows. Mm -hmm. We're still reusing them years later, mm -hmm. but now we have a different solution. Um, with Jill, who um, is working with a lot. She works with the PBG. She works with the Crown mm -hmm. to do a lot of their printing. Things, and she's like, yeah, I'm in. So like she's doing it at a very reasonable rate. And so I will be asking for other business owners to participate next year. If I come into your store, that's why I'm there. <laughs> um, Beth, do you think artists are going to be having a lot of fun with this in the future? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and this is definitely the first winner that I've First of all, I go that down Commercial Street no matter where I'm going now. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, going right. to Stop and Shop. I'm like, take I'm going to take the Commercial Street way. <laughs> and um, I just, I want to just stop and like arm sweep for a musical. Like, and that's never yeah. happened during the winter before. So it's just, again, the connection and the, I didn't know how lovely and easy it would be meeting Donna. And it just, it felt, any word I pick is a little, would be sound like a Lifetime movie, but it was, <laughs> it was really community, family, mm. us, not them. Right. And so I feel differently about every single building. And then I can't help now but see each building and go, oh, I'd love to see so-and-so's work there. That right. would look really good with the landscape and the water peeking through. So I'm designing the whole street. <laughs> nice. Um, and it feels great. Yeah, I have a couple people that have approached me that don't have window frontage. Mm. And they said, 
can we put up, like, how can we do this? Like the guys at the Queen Vic, they're like, we want to mm. do this um, uh, at the Somerset House. She's like, I don't know, let, how, what, what can we do? And, and there are ways we can, we are an artist colony. We advertise ourselves. And the fact of the matter is we're an artist colony. You shouldn't walk down the street of Provincetown and see a blank side of a building or a window or whatever. There should be art at CVS on the walls. Like mm. this place should be covered with art. And because there are cheaper ways to do this without a lot of investment mm. through a computer system, through a printing company, mm. through Jill, like we can make this happen. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, this is the goal that I have. It's like a passion that I have to walk through this. And people like Mark Adams, who the Public Arts Foundation and stuff. Yeah, they're great. They're putting up statues and they're doing like, those are long-term things that we can look at forever. But there are also short-term things that we can do in town to make the town the artist colony that it is. I don't want to see Tweety Bird anymore. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's corporate art. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I, I, it is corporate art, and, and we don't need that. Or, or, and we can do better, and it doesn't cost a lot of money to do. I love also. I love the ideas of even. I love the idea of even though businesses are closed, they can. Um, make these uh, these changes to support the businesses that are open because wouldn't you rather go to the coffee shop that's sandwiched between two buildings that are decorated with beautiful art rather than the one coffee shop next yeah. to two buildings with brown paper? Right? Correct. And, and I don't want to, like, a, a, my goal is not to shame anybody into, like, yes, a, it no, it's not. <laughs> Actually, no, normally it is. No, <laughs> La Larry Mueller, who has Pita Massage, he, te he Facebook, uh, they, he's like, Mark, I saw your article in the Independent. Thank you, Provincetown Independent. Um, and he's like, I'm closed for the first time ever. And I put brown paper in the window. And I was like, oh my God, how embarrassing. And he's like, <laughs> and I called my artist friend and said, go put some art up in the window. Sure. And it, it doesn't take much. Yeah. And I just think that if people know there's a solution and it doesn't cost them a lot of money or time or effort, like I'm going to hang all of this stuff. Like it's just, uh, it's a no brainer to me. Yeah. yeah. And again, Next year, when a lot more people are involved in this, it will certainly be a no-brainer. And then the next year, you know, if you're closed for six weeks, there's a bylaw that says you <laughs> have to put some art in the window. I don't care, put pink paper in the window yeah. or a rainbow, anything, yeah. anything, yeah. anything. So Seth, where else can people see your work? Um, at the Commons mm -hmm. um, and on Instagram. And um, even seeing my, my work on Commercial Street now, I've been thinking larger as well. Yeah, I love that. Because it doesn't seem like something that couldn't happen. Right. So that's nice. If you yeah. see some art in town and it's outrageously colorful, it's a good chance that it's Beth's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway, and, and, and Fran O'Neill is another one of the artists yeah. that we had. He's up at The Crown. And then we have Benji and Paul. We have yeah. Beth. And the other one is totally escaped. Oh, my God. Naya. And Naya, Naya yeah. Brichter at Lewis Brothers. And yeah. I, I wanted to work with um, artists that didn't have gallery representation mm. because I just want more people to see their work That's but awesome. naya who does paintings of ice cream on the beach i was like <laughs> well this is kind of yeah. a no-brainer brainer yeah. and dave um uh, the guys at lewis brothers i'd asked them about this for years and i never got off my ass to do it and finally i said hey dave can we can we do this art thing next year because i was too lazy about it and then naya's work i saw it and i was like Hey Dave, and he was like, "Yeah, it's a no-brainer." And I know Naya, and yeah, I'll buy two of them, and I will perfect. put them up. So, like that art in that window looks incredible, That's and it's perfect. perfect. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. And it's also so magical to hear as you've gone through this process to hear that artists are always like, yes, of course I will. Businesses are always like, yes, yeah. of course I will. Yeah. And it just takes that spark that Mark is contributing mm -hmm. to get it moving forward. And I think this will be a success. Yeah, yeah. And ultimately, if it's if it's funny, like uh, Beth and Fran and Naya, like they, they donated their the use of their image. But I feel like the artists also, like if there's funding that's not coming out of my pocket, um, you know, they should get a stipend for use of their work. And I know it's advertising for them, but everyone should be paid for their work Definitely. in some small way. So yeah. it, it doesn't, it's like to do a giant window to have it printed was $200. Mm. And that awesome. doesn't include like a, a thing for the artist, but it's not like, and they will have that for years until they decide I want a new artist and then we'll rotate them around or whatever. So I love that. I also can't wait for this weekend, the winter windows weekend. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah, like, that's, gonna be that's a good, again, a no-brainer. Outdoor it's gallery yeah, stroll. Outdoor oh, totally. gallery stroll. We can have street performers. Like, you right. know, it could yeah. be a thing oh, yeah. in that second week of January when nothing else is going on. Yeah. yeah. So I love that. Yeah, thank you both for helping. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank and you Beth, thanks for that. coming in. Mark, thanks for stepping around the camera. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah. thank, thank, you. Yeah. thank you for shaming everybody, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you to our sponsors, the Crown and Anchor, Provincetown Brewing Company, The Boat Slip, Shipwreck at the Brass Key, and the Provincetown Business Guild. Uh, thank you for waking up in Provincetown. Wherever you are. And we'll see you next time. We will. Good morning, everybody. Wake up. Wake up, wake up. In Provincetown.